for everything the big the small the in between because whatever gets left will grow and in order to grow they have to eat to grow and we're talking about at least 22 juvenile fish in any one sitting for the lion fish so we we yes we one fish? yes one fish. one, one, one fish. lion fish one meal is anywhere from 20 22 juvenile fish whatever their stomachs can hold they will eat until they are full lionfish are gluttonous feeders and their stomach can expand 30 times its normal size to accommodate all that food when food's not available guess what they do they shut down it's almost like hibernation their metabolism slows way way down and they've done uh, trial studies in the lab where they starved lionfish for three months and none of the lionfish died and they only lost 10% of their body mass. So imagine in Jamaica's already overfished waters, a predator like the lionfish with no natural enemies. The lionfish, which eats up to 30,000 juvenile fish in one year, could single-handedly wipe out the entire fishing industry. For lionfish, uh, the prey preference, which is looking at what the lionfish is eating, we have found a variety of fish. Um, they are both economically and um, biologically important species. But economically, we have been finding um, fish such as snappers, groupers, parrotfish, which all of us Jamaicans love. Um, we also have been finding a number of squirrel fish. These are less of economic importance, but for us in Jamaica, we do consume them a lot. Uh, doctor fish, we have been finding a lot of ocean surgeons, and we've been finding rats. We also have been finding a number of crustaceans. We have found variety of species of shrimp. We have found crab. Um, we have not found any lobsters species yet but other countries have been reporting that and of course that is of importance to us. It's, it can also, the inv this invasion may also have serious implications on the economics of fisheries. Fishermen are certainly coming on and they have been one of our main targets um, in terms of training them. We have done training workshops around the island um, at a majority of the fishing beaches and they have been trained in how to remove spines. Um, we tell them about lionfish, the whole invasion, um, the impacts they're having such as removing the, the juveniles from the fish stocks. And we, they definitely know how to remove spines, first aid treatment, and they are definitely on board in removing the fish stocks. So they have been a big help to us as well. They have been catching them in pots, and I must say that this pilot project, the scientific aspect of it, has been, um, been done in conjunction with fishermen, so they give us some of their local knowledge and we use that um, in the science that we are doing. So it is a joint effort with the fishermen as well. The UWI-operated Discovery Bay Marine Lab has been researching the lionfish with an aim of controlling the beautiful monster. Now, a part component of the research um, here composed of looking at the feeding preferences of lionfish, that is looking at what it is feeding on and how it may impact the marine ecosystems. We also looked on the population densities. Uh, we focused here in Discovery Bay on three sites. So far, population densities have been showing a reduction. So that is one of the things that we can say is a success from the pilot project is that through or, or a combination of all these things, research and public education, and certainly the public assisting us by consuming the lionfish, um, our research is showing that there is there, there has been a reduction, certainly here in Discovery Bay. Um, we certainly need the public's help to continue eating lionfish around the other parts of the island so that they can start having a downward trend. In, in other words, they can have a reduction in their populations um, in other parts of the island. So we are imploring the public to continue eating lionfish and that is certainly a way that we can conserve our marine biodiversity. In Pear Tree Bottom, um, it started out at 
approximately 66 lionfish per hectare and recently we have done studies which is showing somewhere um, at 6 to 10 lionfish per hectare and certainly they are being found at deeper depths. Uh, when the project started we could go to 20-30 feet and we would find lionfish easily. Now we are going at 80 to 100 feet and you have to search to find lionfish. So, um, but I must say that there are parts of the island that we need to do more work on. So there are parts that we need to start removing the lionfish and the, the efforts of this pilot is, be, is, I think, very successful and we need to continue um, with the help of everybody. Um, including local fishers and the public to consume land fish. It was through their work that the National Eat It to Beat It program was launched in 2011. NEPA, the Ministry of Agriculture and several private sector entities, including Scotia Bank and Rainforest Seafoods, have been supporters of the program. We have been very fortunate to have partnered with a variety of private sectors, ENGOs and other institutions. Uh, Rainforest is one of such partners we have. They have assisted us with the public education aspect of it. Um, I also have to make mention of Scotia Foundation and the Sanders Foundation who have assisted us with the public education aspects as well as training aspects. Um, to date, Rainforest still is a part of our support group and they are always willing to assist us where possible. A part of the public education campaign, this lab has been sponsored by the MTI Isaac project. And of course, these tanks are for scientific research, but we also have lionfish here in the Marine Invasive Species Lab for public education purposes. Um, so the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, we have a different variety of audience that comes here and a major part of that audience uh, is school children and they are excellent tools to get the information out. So they will come as a part of the tour, this is one of the stops and they learn about lionfish, they get to see a lionfish. Sometimes if we do have um, live food, they will see how they consume the food. We teach them about the invasion, other invasives in general, the impacts they're having on our um, local biodiversity. And of course, we teach them a little bit about first aid because that is very useful um, to them. So these lionfish here are for public display and we are going to be doing some science on them as well. And the experts say the campaign, which encourages eating of the lionfish, has been very successful with lionfish sightings decreasing in and around Discovery Bay. A 32 months period, we have seen a reduction in the population densities um, of lionfish, um, part of which um, I think a main reason for that was due to the Let's Eat It, Beat It campaign. And therefore, we did a lot of public education around the island, and we got people to start eating lionfish. That is an excellent way for us here in Jamaica to get rid of such an invasive, which is actually very tasty and have now shown to have good nutritional benefits. We are currently um, looking at the passive capture mechanism, which is um, something like looking at fish pots. How can we get rid of the lionfish through putting down um, pots? We're looking at how, what are we going to use to bait them, how long do we soak these pots for. Um, and so those are some of the things that we're, we're doing. We also actively remove lionfish, and that is through um, removing them using pose pairs. And from those, we collect data to carry out our research. Another component that we have um, been doing is actually we have developed a train the trainer program which is educating the wider public about 
the marine invasive, how you can handle it safely, how to remove the spine safely, and how they can prepare the fish for the public. And in turn, those trainees will become trainers at the end of the program, and that is a way for us to build capacity around the island to continue the work of this pilot project uh, to increase public education and to further reduce the populations of lionfish in our waters. My experience in Negril is the opposite. I would say that there might be places where we have the spear fishermen working or the water sports of the all-inclusives are working. Um, they clean up their little areas where they dive, which is true. But in other areas where it's not a regular kind of dive taking place or regular kind of spear fishermen coming, I'll find easy, easy, 18 on one dive. We're talking about 20, 25 minutes being under the water. And at the heart of it, this is a problem with invasives. They're notoriously hard to control. In fact, once they get a foothold in an area, they're literally there forever. So we're being invaded by crayfish, lionfish, and a couple of plants. We'll continue to look at the aliens among us when we come back. Welcome back to our Live at 7 special report, The Aliens Among Us. So far, we've been getting some pretty mixed reviews about Jamaica's success in combating these alien invading species. But there is some hope on the horizon as the Jamaican iguana, which was once thought to be extinct, has now been brought back to life. Here once again, Yolan Giles Lee. <laughs> alien invasive species, AIS, are not new to Jamaica. In fact, our first invaders, the Spaniards, did what AISs typically do. They come in, take over an area, and wipe out its original inhabitants. So, the Spanish came in 1494, and by 1655, when the English, another set of AIS took over the island, the Tainos, Jamaica's original inhabitants, were all but extinct. Another alien invasive species, the Indian mongoose, was brought into the island in 1872. They were supposed to kill off the rats, which, by the way, were also an alien invasive species plaguing the sugarcane industry. When the mongoose got through with the rats, they turned on our indigenous snakes and iguanas, both of whom were here alongside the original Taino population. To this very day we still have mongoose, so much so that they've made it into our folklore. But the yellow snake and the iguana, not so much. In fact, the Jamaican iguana, the country's largest native land mammal, was once believed to be extinct. And then in 1990, it literally came back from the dead. The last of the set of iguanas were observed on Goat Island and those had already died and the rediscovery was made by a, uh, a hunter hunting for pigs and his dog, uh, Mr. Duffus, his dog in, back in the 90s, 1990, brought back a live specimen. Since then, the UWI's Life Sciences Department, in conjunction with NEPA, have embarked on an ambitious project to save what is a world treasure. The Head Start project is one in which the endangered species, the iguana, Jamaican iguana, um, is taken as a hatchling from its location in Hellshaw, uh, brought to the zoo, and it's given a, a fighting chance to survive because they can't survive as a hatchling in totality there because of the predation by mongoose predominantly. So at, here at the Hope Zoo, they have a secure environment. Where we're standing right now is an off-limit area to the public, and the juveniles are taken here as hatchlings when they, they come across, and they're for want of a better word, fattened up, um, given a chance to grow to a, a length in which they can survive out in the wild, and they are repatriated, so to speak, back to um, their actual hatching grounds and released there. All the juveniles are pit tagged and marked for identification, 
and so that when we are monitoring there, which we do on a regular basis, they are, as you can see, survival rates, see who is making it in the wild. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what the Head Start program is all about. IUCN is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Okay. And this is an international body that ha they, they monitor worldwide species. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, the Jamaican iguana is of worldwide importance because it was once thought to have been extinct. Mm -hmm. And having a population here that is now thriving and surviving, there's plans ahead to keep it um, very viable so that the I mean it's 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 our natural history it's one of our biological um, pluses a plus for our conservation and the conservation world is really engaged and really enthused about the way it has been happening this is a part of the Hope Zoo that is not open to the public in fact not that many cameras get to see what's taking place here either this is where a critical part of the work of bringing back a species from the brink of extinction is taking place. We'll call it Iguana Hotel. Because we have been having, in recent times, success with um, breeding females that have been repatriated there. And the, it's estimated now that we have um, a, a six-fold reproduction for, for the actual animals in the wild. The Head Start program doesn't take every single animal from the Helsha Hills. What we do is we take a small percentage. On average, maybe about 30, 35 to 40 animals are taken here. And then the, those animals are grown, screened, and then once they are healthy enough, they're re-released. The Jamaican iguanas, we're looking at about 210 animals to date. Well, we've been releasing since 2006, and the numbers have varied, but certainly last year was a record year for us to release actually 52 animals from the Head Start program. You see, it's more than just as Transport Works and Housing Minister Dr. Omar Davies termed it to little lizard. After an extended all-expense-paid stay at the all-inclusive Iguana Hotel up at the Hope Zoo, those iguanas, who the experts believe can fend for themselves, get reintroduced into the wild. That is, back to their natural habitat of the Hellshire Hills, part of the Portland Bight area. The desired weight, um, it's predominantly the weight, not the length, for release because that weight allows them to fend for themselves, um, have enough body mass to survive the harsh environment. Because as you can well imagine, here at Four Star Hotel, they are being fed on a regular diet um, and on a regular schedule. But once they're released in the wild, they're going to fend for themselves. So they need to have retain, attain about um, 1,000 grams um, of body weight and that will allow them to be able to adapt. The Studies are also being done, conducted now, to determine from the wild, uh, scats from the wild, that is their stool, um, what they're predominantly feeding on the wild. And that kind of food stock is going to be introduced to the, um, the Head Start individuals so that they are accustomed to that food source. So it makes the transition, which I'm hoping to make the transition that much easier. So every year before we actually do a release of our Head Started animals, we do a health screening process. And I must at this point acknowledge some of our collaborators such as Fort Worth Zoo. So every year they will send on their vet team along with other zoos who participate in the program to basically do a, a health screening process and that is basically an idea of determining if the animal is fit for release. And so we look at various indicators in terms of blood chemistry and also in terms of a body mass index to see how large it is, how much body fat.